Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started this afternoon. Oh, excellent. Well, welcome. It's great to see so many people here today for such an important topic, and that is campus safety. So I'd like to welcome you to our second Campus Safety Town Hall, sponsored by the COPS Advisory Committee. As I believe most of you are aware, there is a, a state law that has changed regarding um, concealed carry and that that exemption expires next June. So today we're here to present quite a bit of information to you regarding the college's um, proposed policies that are under development right now and many safety enhancements that are also, some have already been put into place and some are being considered for future in, in development as well. Um, we, I wanted to bring up that we're not really here today to discuss the merits of that law, but rather to discuss how JCCC is in the process of putting together policies and procedures so that we can be in compliance with that law and to make sure that our campus remains as safe and secure as possible. Um, I want to remind everyone that today's session is being taped and I believe live streamed as well for those of the um, campus community that couldn't be here today. And then I finally, I'd like to ask everyone if you could hold your questions until the end. We've left ample opportunity at the end for your questions and concerns and um, feedback. Um, that way we can get through the content and maybe some of your questions will be answered as part of the presentation. Okay, as I mentioned, safety is a top priority for the college and the college administration and the board of trustees are carefully considering the impact of the law that we previously mentioned on our campus. And as always, your voice is very important to us. Um, on your way in, I don't know if you picked one of these up, if not the esteemed <coughs> Sergeant Keaton will be happy to bring you one. We have these comment cards for you to write on. If you have comments or questions that you either don't get to today or don't feel comfortable bringing up today. Also, he's, when he's coming around, if you didn't pick up one of these cards, this has the COPS Advisory Committee information on it as well as an email address that you can contact us at any time after this session. So either grab one from Officer Keaton or grab one on your way out today. Okay, so today we're going to be, um, just to give you a little overview of what we're going to be covering, we'll talk just briefly a reminder of what the COPS Advisory Committee is and what its purpose is. Um, Dr. Larson and um, Elisa Pacer will give us some updates on some potential weapons policy elements in our policy that it's currently under development. Um, we'll talk about some safety updates, some physical safety considerations, um, and then we'll talk about next steps, and then we'll have that open comment period at the end for questions, comments, and concerns. Okay, I'd like to introduce our panel participants. I'll start with myself. My name is Janelle Vogler. I'm the Executive Director of Audit and Advisory Services. I'm also the co-chair of the COPS Advisory Committee along with Elisa Pacer. Um, we have Dr. Larson here in the center. Um, she is the Executive Vice President of Finance and Administrative Services. Elisa Pacer on the end, Emergency Preparedness Manager. And then we also have Chief Greg Russell from our JCC Police Department. Okay, um, just a quick reminder about the COPS Advisory Committee. Um, I think there are several members of the committee here in the audience. If you're in the audience and part of the committee, could you wave your hand, maybe stand up? Okay, these are your members. Um, if I could remind everyone that the role of the committee is to solicit feedback from you, the campus community. And we take that feedback, we take it back to cabinet, and that helps inform safety considerations and safety decisions that are being made. Okay, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Larson, who's going to take us through some potential policy considerations. Thank you, Janelle, and thank you to everyone for being here this afternoon. We really appreciate seeing you. Those institutions governed by KBOR, uh, that is the state universities, were required to have draft policies to KBOR by October 1st. That's why Many of you who have been following this issue closely are beginning to see draft policy language out um, either on KBOR websites or on those state university websites and also those policy statements have been uh, getting some coverage from the media. What we will be sharing with you as potential language for our campus community to consider and for our board to consider will uh, in many cases look very similar to what you have seen drafted 
by the universities. So again, this is not the policy itself um, or a draft policy itself, but certainly uh, the framework that we are considering uh, for your public input and for your feedback as well as eventually uh, to our Board of Trustees. So again, just a reminder in terms of open and concealed carry, the current status of the, of the law in the state of Kansas, open carry, uh, an individual must be 18 or older, must be in lawful possession of a gun and have no restrictions or prior record and no license is required. For concealed carry, um, most of the uh, requirements are the same. An individual must be 21 years of age. What does that mean for Johnson County Community College? Open carry is prohibited in open spaces and in buildings. So open carry at Johnson County Community College is prohibited, period. Concealed carry is allowed in open spaces currently. It is prohibited in all JCCC buildings, and this statutory exemption is to be, uh, there is signage in place, obviously, uh, now, and the exemption is to be lifted. We are under a four-year exemption, um, and the exemption is to complete, be lifted on July 1st, 2017. And by the way, I'm not sure Janelle mentioned, all of these slides will be available on the Concealed Carry website within a matter of days. Um, so again, when I see people taking notes, please be assured that you will be able to see all of these slides uh, and we will make an announcement when those are on the Concealed Carry website. So again, what's changing? I think we're all aware on July 1st, current exemption expires so that concealed carry would be allowed not only in open spaces as it is now, but also in our facilities, other than as specifically prohibited by the college in accordance with state statute. So again, this policy language is about how do we comply with state statute. We have a current weapons policy in place that's available on our website, it has been. It addresses all weapons, not just guns prohibits the possession or use of firearms, firearms, explosives, or other weapons within a college building or facility. Current policy applies to all students, visitors, and employees. And there are certain exemptions, of course, for our police department um, and others authorized in writing by the JCCC chief of police. And firearms within vehicles is legal. Uh, and violations are subject to disciplinary action. So when we go through these proposed policy considerations, I'll be speaking of them in three categories. Those things that will remain the same, regardless of what happens on July 1st. Those things that we would propose to modify or tweak based on what is happening on July 1st and new language. Certain elements would remain the same. Applicability, whatever we hope the board would eventually adopt would still apply to students, visitors, and employees. Weapon statement would be the same. Other than exceptions specifically addressed in the policy, it would prohibit the possession of weapons on campus uh, and when attending off-campus uh, programs and activities and open carry would still be prohibited. So the definition of a weapon would remain the same. Enforcement would remain the same. Right now, violations of our current concealed carry are to be uh, reported and enforced by the JCCC Police Department. That would remain the same. Vehicles, again, under current statute, it is lawful to have a vehicle, uh, a, a weapon, that is hidden from view and locked in your vehicle. That would remain the same. And concealed carry in open spaces is currently allowed under the law. That would remain the same. Now, in terms of modifications, we're proposing that we modify um, the provision in terms of, of 
off-campus programs and activities. And we'll get to that in terms of um, employees that would be authorized to have concealed carry now under this provision may be authorized to have them in off-campus uh, situations and activities, employees. And concealed carry in facilities. And of course, that's a lot of what we've been talking about for these past many months. Obviously still allowed by law enforcement officers, by our own JCCC police. Allowed as necessary by JCCC programs. We teach in the police academy now and we allow weapons to be used in those programs. But then obviously a modification would be that they would be allowed in facilities other than um, when temporary or, temporary or permanent adequate security measures are in place. And we've talked in, we talked in the prior town hall in April, and for those of you, again, who have followed this issue closely, you know that there is a specific definition of adequate security measures if we wish to prohibit concealed weapons coming into our facilities. It is the use of electronic equipment, metal detectors, metal detector wands, or other equipment, and the use of armed personnel at public entrances. Um, to detect and restrict the carrying of any weapons into the state or municipal building or any public area. There's two things that are underlined here, and that's because those are recent changes with the past legislative session. Before, it cer cer simply said personnel had to staff the adequate security measures. Legislative change in this last session added armed personnel um, to that, and it also expanded to or any public area. So presumably within a building, you could restrict access. At this, sorry, at this time, um, it is administration's recommendation that no permanent adequate security measures are being recommended um, throughout the facilities. Um, some of the rationale behind that, um, those decisions, um, architectural lo logistics and feasibility, think about flow of traffic, drawers being propped open, people piggybacking one after the other, um, and the challenge of our buildings, all, many of which being connected. Um, think about the student experience, lines, bottlenecks, late for classes, time management, how early would a student actually have to arrive to be on time for class. Um, the um, important safety initiatives that serve the college pr at the present time, and the cost uh, being prohibitive. Um, again, armed security for those permanent adequate security measures. Now, uh, temporary adequate security measures might be a new term for some of you. So at this time, it's possible that um, JCCC's police department may uh, temporarily designate a specific location within a facility um, prohibiting concealed carry and implement the mobile wanding equipment and adequate security measures, the metal detectors and personnel staffing those on an event, um, typically event specific basis. And Chief, do you want to talk about an example of that? An example of that would have been what we did with the political campaign of Ted Cruz. Um, <clears throat> we have two events that are on our doorstep that may be of concern to the college community, one being the, um, the Jewish community all-star um, event and as well as the naturalization. We work closely with the FBI and other um, liaisons that will give us in time any security information where we will deem this college or the community a threat. If we receive that information, a choice will be made either to have it, and if we choose to have it, then we will implement adequate security measures. And all that simply means, as I said, everyone coming into a enclosed area will have to go through a magnetometer or metal detector, or we will use one. But those are the three examples that we will be addressing or have addressed in the past. Going to keep going with proposed policy revisions, new language that we may be considering in a proposed policy. One is to be 
uh, more overt in terms of the restrictions on concealed carry per the statute. So actually referencing statutory language, concealed firearm must be a handgun. Uh, again, that an individual must be 21 years of age, they must meet drug, alcohol, mental capacity, and criminal history requirements, and they may not carry an automatic firearm or handguns with suppressors or silencers. Concealed must mean concealed, and it must mean that an individual is in complete control of the weapon. So concealed defined would be incorporated into a draft policy language. They must carry, store, and use handgun in a safe manner, uh, honor about the person at all times, so a backpack, purse, or handbag, and that individual must have that backpack, carrier, uh, purse within their immediate control. Um, completely hidden from view. Again, concealed means concealed. We are also exploring, and you have seen similar language in some of the draft policy statements that have been published um, to under the uh, KBOR universities. Um, holsters on the person or in a car carrier. We want to respond to the concern that was expressed by many of you and those who completed the survey that was sponsored by the faculty and the survey that was sponsored by the COPS committee that accidental discharge was, a, was an area of concern. Um, so that this kind of language in terms of handguns with an external safety carried with the safety in the on position, semi-automatic handguns carried without a chambered round of ammunition, and revolvers carried with the hammer resting on, a, on an empty cylinder. There has been Attorney General language just last month um, saying that, that th those safety criteria were acceptable um, and so we would wish to consider that language in a policy that we would be preparing for Johnson County Community College. Training. We certainly heard a lot about training. Um, we are at an institution where we already um, support a great deal of training, including the fact that every individual here, whether they're part-time, full-time, has access to uh, $175 for non-credit training of their choice. So we would, in, we're proposing that we include language that would allow employees to use, to access those funds, um, and this could be effective now, to access those funds for a training opportunity on um, handgun safety. And there are a number of programs in the metro area that provide that. We would also, be providing informational sessions on campus for staff and students. Um, reporting violations that we would have suspected violations reported to the JCCC Police Department um, and again as we do now with emergencies reported to JCCC Police or to 911. Storage of concealed carry. This has been an issue, and it's certainly an issue at universities with residence halls. We are proposing that we not offer or provide gun storage at the college. Um, individuals may store a handgun in their vehicle, um, again, so long as the vehicle is locked and it is not visible, but may not store a handgun in office or locker on campus. Um, some of the rationale behind the recommendation for um, no firearm storage on campus would be it creates an additional safety risk. Liability, training, unload procedures, protocols, increase of logistics and operational staffing to accommodate that. Um, gun owner verification, making sure that the gun that would be checked in gets checked out to the appropriate person and the liability associated with that. Um, no existing JCCC storage lockers are acceptable for weapon storage. This would include the gymnasium, outside the Lifetime Fitness Center, the testing center, et cetera. So lockers would not be allowed, just like Dr. Larson said, for office storage would not be allowed. Weapon storage um, could also become a sought-after sought target if people knew that we were storing weapons. So that's some of the rationale based on our administrative recommendation. We are also exploring certain 
we'll say handgun neutral rules, but rules that would affect an individual's um, ability to conceal a handgun. And one example would be, we know that faculty may already require that backpacks in a lab setting be left at the back of the room on a shelf. Well, if we're saying that um, an individual must have control, physical control of a backpack or a purse that contains a concealed weapon, obviously if we were requiring the backpack to remain in the back of the room, that would mean that an individual could not bring a concealed carry, uh, a concealed weapon into that classroom. They'd have to either not have a weapon at all, leave it at home, or have it in their vehicle. Okay, moving right along, we'll talk about some safety updates on campus. Um, so, in spring of 2016, we did multiple surveys. Faculty did a survey, um, the COPS Advisory Committee surveyed students, surveyed um, I'm sorry, staff, um, all employees. And we have listened to the feedback that we received. On the screen, I'll just highlight a few of those. So, gun holder, inadequate training, weapons, mental health concerns, inadequate security, conflict resolution. Um, those are some of the threats that concern individuals on this campus. What steps should JCCC take? Mental health support, conflict resolution training, officer training, more training, officer visibility, access control, number of officers, cameras, safety devices. Um, these were the recurrent themes that we continue to hear from um, the campus community. So in response to some of that, um, I would like to just share with you um, where we're at on some of these safety and security updates. So in this fiscal year, one additional police department officer position has been filled and that was completed as of this fiscal year starting. Um, physical access control considerations. So in a moment, we'll learn about some of the additional security um, access control measures that we could be considering. Um, right now we're in progress of just introducing that information and gathering feedback. We'll talk about that more in detail. The security camera investment, hopefully you folks have read about that either in the board packet or otherwise um, from committee discussions. Uh, it is in progress and moving right along to enhance our security systems, add cameras, um, improve the results of camera and monitoring of camera equipment. Identified training needs. We feel like uh, many of those training needs that you heard on the recurrent themes are in process. So I'd like to just highlight some of those. So from a training and awareness standpoint, again, the recurrent themes were mental health support, conflict resolution, communication, training. These are some of the trainings that we've offered. And before I get into this and you start writing down dates, at all of the entry points to this room, the four entrances, upper level and lower level, on the tables, we have handouts of these upcoming training sessions and the dates that are available for you. So please grab one as you grab a comment card or the COPS advisory card so that you have that information readily available. So for the first time on campus in a very long time, we've offered first aid training. Um, folks said, you know, if something bad happens here, how do we respond to help a person um, until authorities can arrive? So we've offered first aid training, it's the Heart Saver course, and there's an upcoming session in November. We offered several, uh, two sessions during professional development days. Next, I'd like to highlight verbal conflict resolution training. We offered four sessions during professional development days, and we have two sessions um, coming up based on uh, the demand and um, folks asking for it to be held at another time other than professional development day. So if you've not yet signed up for this course, um, it is a vendor course where we're bringing the vendor in and it's a two hour session. And it's this Thursday from four to six. Um, we offered the hours to try to um, accommodate uh, faculty and um, other folks to attend. And then next Monday from two to four. So look for that. Um, and I know it's been on um, in the know many times. We're offering an Alice training session later this month, just as a refresher, in my opinion, if, you've, if it's been 12 months since you've been to an Alice session, it's, that's too long. So attend an Alice session. 
Um, we're also exploring an e-learning module for ALICE training. Um, and the COPS Advisory Committee is reviewing that pr at the present time. Just on October 10th, we offered personal safety training and from time to time do the self-defense training. So know that those opportunities exist. Um, we know that weapons policy awareness training will be needed. So um, basically training on the policy. So what, what can and can't we do? How do we uh, respond to a certain um, event, kind of an FAQ sort of thing, um, frequently asked questions. Mental health awareness training um, is also being explored. Again, we've heard that recurrent theme and we are looking into some of that. How can we offer that training here on this campus um, to keep folks better informed? And then safety and security syllabus draft language. We know that um, this draft language may um, come into play and may need to provide something in that syllabus guideline on a go forward basis. And then not to mention all of the police continued training that they do as a department. Chief, would you like to comment on your training? Yeah, I will add that <clears throat> October 26, 27th, and 28th, as you go about this campus, you know that we are heavily involved with youth programs. Just this past week, we had activities in the, Carl in the Carlson Center Yardley Hall. We had 11 school buses uh, on campus filled with school children. So on the dates that I mentioned, the police academy is offered training uh, we're sending one supervisor, Sergeant Jim Keating, along with two officers. And basically, that training will involve um, just dealing with youth, uh, young people, per se. And it's something that we, the police department, have never, ever done before. We take the opportunity to attend this training because of the environment of our campus. So that is an addition to the vast experience that we have with 23 police officers on this campus. You're looking at approximately 250 plus years of experience. So we like to feel that the updated training that we get goes a long way in keeping this campus as safe as it is. Thank you, Chief. So um, folks, we have just a few more slides to go through and um, and then we will be ready for your questions. So um, related to physical safety considerations, um, keep in mind that what you're gonna see on the next few slides, we are only introducing and exploring these options. We've introduced some of this information to the Faculty Association, Faculty Senate, Student Senate, um, COPS Advisory Committee, of course, to gather some of that feedback and your feedback will be important to us, but this will not be the um, only time that you'll see this information. We'll make sure that it's communicated going forward so that you have an opportunity to comment. Um, so some of these are security options just for consideration um, as enhancements to overall safety and security. Um, once feedback is gathered, recommendations will be made to cabinet. Um, they have to do, they have to do with classroom doors, building access points, and security badges. So I'll briefly talk about those. Thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, classroom doors. So there are options within our current access control system that we can program um, to enhance classroom safety. That's something that we heard as a recurring theme. Um, an opportunity to keep the doors in red status or locked at all times as an option. Um, instructors would have access to that room, but the doors would always stay red, secured. Um, always red locked. Once an instructor would swipe uh, their pass, it would stay green for a predetermined period of time and then revert back to red. So lock status, these are, and again, these are just options that we're reviewing. Again, people have been concerned with overall classroom safety. So the other, lastly, is to leave it as is. Um, we encourage instructors to lock their classrooms as they see fit. And I, and talking with students and instructors, I do know that several of them, after a certain point in time when the class starts, do lock their classroom doors so that there aren't any surprises at that point. 
Um, the next option is a toggle switch, and I'll just explain that briefly. But it's an emergency locking mechanism that would be installed inside a classroom so that you could physically lock the classroom door from inside the classroom. Right now, you would have to open the door and swipe your badge outside of the door to be able to lock that classroom door. So um, we're moving forward with setting up a, a few demo rooms that we can tour and have you experience and um, give us your feedback on. So um, we're moving forward with that. So look for those communications. Your feedback is really important if that's something we would do as an enhancement for all classrooms. Next, building access points. So again, these are considerations. We're considering reducing the number of public entrances, and I'll let the chief talk about the Carlson Center example. We're also considering restricting access during hours the campus is closed. So chief, can you talk about those? Well, the Carlson Center, which is diagrammed here for you, has, has 11 entry points as we speak. Um, would, if we go to implementing what is recommended, we will close seven of those as public entrances, meaning those entrances will still be available to uh, staff members on campus. Um, what that will allow us, the police, to do is concentrate on the other remaining areas. In a given day, um, when things could be somewhat hectic, um, it would minimize the amount of attention that we would have to pay to an entrance and would definitely help in this case. Would it prevent you as staff members from gaining access to the building? Absolutely not but it would definitely um, control the flow, the in and out, and um, help provide better security in the event we had to implement an emergency situation. I have one more. So, no, no, sorry. So, and last consideration um, is about identification badges or um, access cards. So, um, it's been explored that this could be a sign of the JCCC community. Um, identification of faculty and staff um, would be important for both students and visitors to recognize, here's someone that can help me, it's an employee of the college, representative. Um, the photo ID um, is great for police when they're unlocking a space for someone. They immediately would know that they're doing that for the right person and not have to ask for an additional ID, et cetera. Um, we believe this could be an overall security and safety enhancement to the campus community as a move towards easier identification for those people that we know are here on a regular basis. Okay, to kind of um, follow up to that, um, where we're going to be going next from here. Um, the draft policy, we expect to put um, a, a draft of that policy out on our webpage for comment from the campus community within the next several weeks. Um, the policy elements that were described today will be part of that um, draft policy. We expect the Board of Trustees to be reviewing that draft policy by the end of the year, most likely in December, but by the end of the year is our expectation. Um, and then. The policy should be adopted by the board sometime in the spring. Um, again, as all the training elements that we've discussed and continuing to develop, that you can expect more training in the January professional development days, as well as, again, in August of next year. Um, online, par, um, online formats are being explored, as well as on demand. I know Elisa and her staff are always willing to bring those trainings to you, to your staff meetings, et cetera. Um, again, continued safety programming. Um, we'll continue to be reaching out from the COPS Advisory Committee to all different campus constituencies on these different safety recommendations that Elisa just covered and that Chief Russell just covered. Um, additional feedback, don't forget the email address. It's on the bottom of your card. And then I'd also like to point your attention to the Concealed Carry webpage. Um, we'll be putting today's um, recording out. This is actually the recording from last spring, as well as the PowerPoint from today's slides. And then we continue to post information. This is likely where you'll see the draft policy as well, but we will be sending something out to the campus community so you'll know where to find that. Um, this is the address jcc.edu backslash concealed carry. 
Okay. So if what, I, I'm sorry, if I could ahead. just add to that, um, just keep in mind too that the concealed carry webpage site is not a site that you go to for reporting emergencies. So yes. it's not uh, non-emergency reporting. Um, of course, you would call 469-2500 campus police in the event of an emergency. Um, and then secondly, if you see on the slide that Janelle has up, it says submit feedback. So um, this goes to the COPS Advisory Committee by submitting information this way as well. So just, just keep that in mind. There's multiple ways to re report, ask questions, um, and provide your comments. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Oops. Okay. Now we're ready for the open comment and question and feedback period. Um, like I mentioned earlier, if you could limit your comments to around two minutes that would be great to give everyone a chance to speak and if you could please state your name and your relationship to the college that would be really helpful so we have microphones um, at the front on each side but if you have any concerns with making your way down to the microphone just wave your hand and we'll have someone bring a microphone up to you oh don't be shy <laughs> I'm not really JCCC, but okay. uh, I'm with BNSF over oh. in the TTC building, okay. uh, or ITC building. My first question is, can you define what open spaces is? Open spaces is outside of a building. Open okay, so it's not outside. commons areas. No. Okay. Uh, and then my secondary question was, has it been brought or thought of that if, if you go to ID cards, that the ID cards and the access cards need to be kept separate because if they get lost together, then anybody can get into the JCC areas. Oh, that's very good feedback. Okay. Yeah, I think a, a good point to that would be too that if we would have to encourage early reporting of lost IDs if it did remain two, two ID badges that are kept together um, and that access can be immediately turned off. So that's a solution I believe to that we would just have to encourage folks to report that immediately but, but thank you Jean that idea of a, a true one card system where it's a both your ID and an access card has been brought up before it's just a matter of changing systems and all that entails I know with us particularly we don't put our logo on our access cards mm -hmm. for that yes thank you great thank you Sorry, I don't usually need a microphone. Um, my name is Scott Craig. I teach over in the EMS department. And so I have two questions, one for the kind of whole committee and then another one for the chief. Uh, so the first question is, uh, during our training programs, we have students kind of assessing, physically assessing each other as they learn, you know, the process of how to take care of a sick patient in the field. Mm -hmm. And so one of my colleagues had brought up a concern to the advisory committee, and I was just curious about, you know, with some of the language that you guys are proposing, I mean, if we have students with their hands on other students by design in the classroom, how would the policy, what would be our solution to those students that would want to campus carry? And then, or conceal carry. And then my second question for the chief is, you know, you guys talked a little bit about the language about the safety being on and the uh, round not being chambered and then the empty uh, cylinder on the revolvers. How would that be enforced or looked for or assessed in any way, shape or form? I mean, how would we, how would we know any of those criteria were being met? Well, let me see if I can answer you first. Fair enough. Um, because it's a hands-on program that you may implement that day, you may have that day, my recommendation would be to say to anyone, okay. if you conceal carry, because what we will be doing this day, another student may find it offensive. Right. Yeah. So for their safety concern, would you not carry a weapon that particular day? Okay. To address the second question, the only way that can be addressed is if, in fact, we were to get a complaint. Okay about an individual carrying a weapon. Understood. Then with the complaint, we can investigate it. And um, if we find that person in violation, then we can deal with it that way. But we are not going to simply look for sure. an individual that might have an outline of a weapon and then do a courtesy stop or a stop period to inspect the weapon to make sure they are in compliance. Understood. 
Can I also say, because it's a great question, in terms of specifics for your program, the policy that we put forth won't answer every specific oh, um, issue. And what we plan to do is once we have a policy that's in draft form is to really come up with FAQs that would also be on websites because there will be many specific instances sure, yeah. like that, that that may be much longer and more detailed than in a four-page policy statement. Understood. Thank okay. you. Good Thank questions. You Mary Hanover, Admin Assistant, Business Division. I want to kind of build on the question that he had. So considering the recent training, the videos that we had for Alice, et cetera, and Alert, if we were to see someone on campus, by, like in the video where the uh, person who was coming onto campus had a pistol in his, in his back belt, I'm assuming if we see someone on campus, if there is a concern, because you won't know if that person has a permit or not, that it is best to simply, you know, see something, say something, and let you all make the appropriate decision at that time. Would that be correct? I'm yeah. assuming yes. training will change for this, et cetera, because. That is correct. We still want you to say whatever it is that you see. Allow us to do the investigation as opposed to you not reporting to us at all. Okay. And if I could add to that, just keep in mind that if you're seeing the weapon, then that's no longer concealed. So that would technically violate policy and allow us to further pers pursue that. Thank you. Great question, thank you. Let me say, um, just let me add to the adequate security measure um, that may be put in place. If you, as a concealed carry, was to accidentally walk into what is considered that adequate security measure space, you would say, what would happen to me? Um, I think by policy, we would ask you to simply return to your vehicle and secure that weapon in your vehicle. So it would eliminate the fear of probably of you being arrested. Um, we give you the opportunity to comply with the policy in place. Now, if you decide not to uh, comply with that policy, then it brings in another way for the police to become involved. And certainly you're not going to be charged with carrying a concealed weapon there's another charge that may come into place. So that is important for you to know. We're, we're not going to make this a police state. Um, we want to always, again, safety is first and foremost, but there are policies and there are rules that you must follow once we um, present it to the board and it becomes board approved. Stephen Navarro, Veteran Services. I just want to thank the uh, advisory committee for working on this so, so diligently. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So in some downtime, I'm just going to add, keep in mind the training sessions on all four entry points to this room. On the tables are the comment cards for your feedback if you didn't um, want to ask the question or provide feedback in open forum. And then the upcoming trainings that we have um, this week and next week and then early November, first aid, CPR, AED, verbal conflict resolution. Um, if you've not considered, I can't express that enough, but if you've not considered taking that, I think it would be a well use of your time. Um, and then the Alice refresher training. And then we have some building emergency leaders, so some bell refresher training coming up too. I see some bells in the audience, so thank you. Any other questions or concerns? We definitely wanna hear from you if you have anything to share with us.
I'm not going to make you stay in the room until there's another question, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, oh, wait. I'm Dennis Sarge, I teach philosophy and also a president of the faculty association. Um, so from a faculty perspective, if we see a weapon in a classroom that we know that person is in violation of the policy, just as a practical matter, would the best response be to go straight to the phone and dial 4111, confront the students? No, I, your best interest would be to go ahead and call us and let us do the, um, the inquiry as to the weapon itself. Um, we will not ask you as a faculty member to put yourself in that danger situation to confront a student. As you know, for example, this time period, it's very stressful for students and anything could happen right. at that point. So please relay to your faculty members that that is not a position the college is asking okay. them to take. Well, one concern I've heard is that if we dial 4111, they might get upset about that. So maybe we just quietly go there and pick it up and not let them know what we're doing. Um, if I could also add, um, there's also an, another option, Dennis, um, to consider using the JCCC Guardian app where you can text campus police, okay. which is monitored 24 by 7. You could also, again, use the, you could, the call feature, but if the text could be a secondary option for you in the situation you describe. Just be specific on room numbers and those kinds of things. Dennis, I'm glad you asked that because that, that kind of ties into the training that Elisa referred to in the spring because we do plan to hold training sessions on what the new policies and the new mean for everyone. And that's exactly the kind of question everyone has on their minds. So mm -hmm. that's the, exactly what we want to include in that training is what to do in that type of situation. My name is Christy Howell. I work here in the Center for Sustainability, and I'm asking a question for my colleague, Crystal Antel. Um, so she's concerned about our interns who do a lot of physical labor on campus and that a weapon would be a potential safety concern. She's curious if we can prohibit interns from caring while they work. It would have to be a very specific safety issue, um, Christy. I mean, we have to comply with the law and the law is going to allow in the law of course a lot of your interns work outside where right now concealed carry is legal um, so it would have to be a matter of understanding a very specific safety consideration that would inhibit their ability to conceal Don't forget, if there's anything, you, you have several different ways. I know I've said this before. There's the email address. Write it on the card. Drop it on your way out. Or on the Concealed Carry webpage, there's a place to submit comments and questions as well. Or contact any of your COPS advisory members that happen to be in your areas. So I don't want to cut off any questions. Oh, here's another one. Okay. Um, I don't know how new policies are normally made uh, known to the student body, mm -hmm. but um, I think that I'm one of the few students at a town hall, uh, so how are these policies going to made, be made known to the rest of the students? Good question. Well, certainly, that's a great question, and thank you for being here. Um, we will ask our colleagues in uh, student life, I'm seeing many of them here, we we have gone to student senate. I don't know if you're a student senator, um, but we'll ask for their help. I see um, Pam Vassar here, um, Mindy Kinneman here, and we will uh, work to get the word out um, through all means possible. But thank you for that question. I'm Myra Young in the speech department, and to echo his comments, I'm, I'm amazed by the number of students in my classes when it comes up, just kind of accidentally or however it comes up, who don't know this is coming at all. So that information is going to be real important. Um, my other question had to do with next summer. When this happens, it happens in the middle of an academic term. Mm -hmm. And so I'm kind of 
concerned about that transition. I mean, we'll have four-week classes and four-week classes, and those make more sense. But for the eight-week classes where that occurs right in the middle, you know, what does the syllabus look like? Do you announce it in the middle of class? Oh, by the way, now you can carry a gun. Um, so I think that transition is something to think through about how we communicate it um, both officially and informally in those summer classes. Very good point. Absolutely noted. Thank you. Anything else? Well, I would like to thank everyone for coming today. Um, you can expect to hear from us on all the methods we've shown, and um, we will uh, most likely have another town hall um, after some more policies have been, um, probably after the first of the year would be my guess. So uh, we'll, we'll keep you posted. So thank you very much for coming, and um, have a good rest of your day. Thank you, everyone.